I think that if God made himself so evident, so accessible, and by the way, historically, the vast majority of people have believed in God. Now, once again, I don't want to fall into an ad hoc fallacy, but I think, once again, there, there, one, it has to raise a question. Why is it that the vast majority of people, not just now, but over human history, have found themselves inclined to believe about God? I would suggest to you that, and, and, and to refer specifically to Christian theism, I think the reason is that God made himself so obviously evident to everyone that everybody would be compelled to believe him, whether they were righteous or unrighteous. Uh, and so the Adolf Hitlers, the Saddam Husseins, all those people would be compelled to, to, to worship God. And once again, that's not what God wants. And so I would argue that what he wants is people who seek, seek after him. So, by the way, uh, that Hitler was, um, Hitler at least proclaimed to be a Christian, just to... Well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, they're at the background. Uh, speak up just a little bit. I'm, I'm not sure what, there, what your argument is, so I'm not... Can you repeat the question? Matter creates the mind. It's not a, it's not a question. He's just made a statement. Matter was there, and he created the mind. Matter is an evolution. You see, more mind building. The connection, the communication operations within the body to tell the body what to do. Well, that was built over time through evolution. Which mind was built. There's no question. Yeah, I, I think it's just an assertion. I, I, and there's certainly just have been some interesting attempts to demonstrate that. Uh, I, and I would say, if you read, uh, once again, any of the standard works of the anthology and philosophy of mind, I mean, and this is not an issue just for a theist, even most naturalist philosophers, even a Daniel Den, will acknowledge that we don't have this all explained. So I, I'm not convinced that there is actually an explanation there right now. Um, now, my question would be, if you take mind to be physical, or do you take mind to be non-physical? And once again, if you take mind to be non-physical, you still have a problem. And that is, how does, how does a non-physical mind, how can that be explained in a strictly physical world? Would you like to respond real Yes. Um, let's see, I have two points actually that I want to make. Um, one is this, you, you again said, well, why do so many people over the years have believed in God? Well, and why is it shrinking? Well, I could add that, right? So, I mean, thousands of years ago, people probably believed that the earth was flat. Uh, and, but, but, but knowledge uh, and then science has uh, led to a drop in that list. And so by learning more about this world, by finding alternative explanations, people don't need God as an explanation of the world. That, I think, is an explanation why um, you asked the question as a response to gentleman over there. Um, uh, regarding, um, regarding mind, um, I don't want to go there. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, the, the, the Earth was flat is an urban legend. Uh, Jeffrey Burton Russell of the University of California, Santa Barbara, who's a historian, has demonstrated that that actually was not a white health belief. Thank you. Um, let's take up there, black. Uh, you mentioned that only 7% of the National Academy of Sciences believe that there's some type of deity. Um, they, they believe in a personal God. Okay, personal God. Along that 7%, is there a discounting of their research because of that? Is there a reason behind them not huh? seeing brains? So, um, I don't know about these, these, these 7% in particular. I know that there is a difference among scientists. So, for example, biologists are um, are typically have a lower belief level, and mathematicians typically a higher belief level. So there are differences, but I don't. And social scientists often also have a higher belief level, but I don't know exactly the number. I could point you to the study that that, that gives these numbers. But could this uh, could this be explained by Thomas Kuhn, for example, who argues that oftentimes certain scientific paradigms reign not strictly based upon the empirical evidence, but by non-empirical considerations. And in fact, when you look at the history of science, that is what we see. Certain theories have dominated, not necessarily because the, oftentimes it may be initially because of the weight of the empirical evidence, 
but over time it becomes the dominant theory. Anybody who disagrees with that is typically ostracized. And I know of at least three scientists who have earned PhDs from well-credentialed universities who have been fired because they have even just raised the question, raised questions about biological evolution. And, and they're not necessarily opposed to Darwin's theory, they're just saying, is that a sufficient explanation? And they lost their jobs. So we probably have time for a couple more questions. Saw you in the Speak up just a little. The question you value, the inner mind is the most important thing. Um, then you would say, does God exist? You might want to have a proposition of saying, if does God exist? So that entity of God that has so, must have some kind of property or attribute associated to it. So the, when you when you start off with that proposition, the axiom of does God exist is already a biased argument, do you think? Because does God exist? You already implicitly applying to that there is a God or there is some object in the very meta level that there is a God. I'm not sure whether I completely understood the question, but um, so, but is it correct that you're asking me that in asking? Um, oh, I'm not sure I, if I understand the question either. The question is, if you ask the question, the proposition, if God exists, this the statement in a meta sense that you need to have some kind of description of what God in order to ask the question. Right, you need to have, give some kind of definition to the term yes. God. Yes. Right, and that's why I've tried to argue from a generic conception. So, with the axiom, is pre, with the, with the untruth axiom, and how can you tell that it's true? I'm not sure if you an untruth axiom. What I'm arguing is that, is it a reasonable conclusion to draw, based upon what we observe in the universe, that there is a God in, a generic, in, this, in this generic sense? Without... Think. Without the knowledge of God, or if you isolate the knowledge, <coughs> the aspect of uh, basically, if you yeah, but maybe maybe you ought to rethink the question you need to ask me afterwards because yeah. you maybe have a big question I'm just not getting it. Gentleman in the black. Yeah, so I, um, I think I heard you correctly when you said the scientists uh, predicted that it would say one in ten to the fifth. Well, no, that was the number that was given based upon uh, various uh, observations concerning the nature of the universe and what's called the fine-tuning argument in terms of the pop, what, what is necessary for human life to exist. What team of science, I mean, that's an enormous number to come up with and an enormous number of, of uh, assumptions. What team of scientists work on it and where's the public? Uh, you can go to, uh, I think it's called fine-tuning.org. Uh, the philosopher is Robin Collins, and I think he can give you a number of sources. There are a number of scientists and philosophers who have been involved in a number of projects. Uh, but that would be, I think it's fine-tuning.org would be the one where you want to go to look at that. I, mean, I have to say one thing. I mean, this, this came up now twice. I mean, there's, there, there are also other explanations for that. I mean, there's this so-called anthropic principle, and um, there are physicists who will think about um, evolution of universes. Um, uh, that, that could explain um, how this particular universe came about. So um, this is really a, a, a very speculative um, uh, area. So, and I, again, I don't think how I don't see how that is an argument for the existence of God. I, I, I don't see it. That, that was my point. Actually, uh, <laughs> that, I think it's too much. Can move on to the next question. We're in the blue. No, no, what, I'm say what I was saying is, um, so the question was um, that because there is a, a, a designer has to be as complex as, as, as the thing that he has designed, that I was saying that therefore it, it, it couldn't exist. I'm, I'm turning the argument that the universe is too com complex uh, to be on, and um, to come into existence by accident, therefore we need a designer who did it. And so I'm arguing, if, if, they, if we postulate the existence of a designer, well, the designer, since he has to be at least as complicated as the universe, is at least as improbable. And so, by the very same argument, we need an explanation for the designer. And then the other thing is, 
actually, since we have the, uh, the, the principle of evolution, we do not need uh, to explain design anymore. We have a perfect, a perfect uh, explanation of how complicated things that look as if they were designed develop from simple things. I just don't see how it follows that uh, <coughs> that we need to explain the designer. I, I don't see, uh, Martin, I'm just not following you how you, that, how you, that. You, you're, you're saying that the universe cannot just exist because it's too complicated. Well, and it's a designer, right? No, so, what I'm saying is the universe was caused. Do you deny that? What? Do you deny the universe was caused? I don't know what, uh, how the universe came into existence. Well, I mean, maybe. but you granted it came into existence. Well, maybe it has existed all the time. I don't know. Well, okay. But the thing is, you're, you're postulating a designer for something because it is so complicated that it couldn't... No, 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 that was my argument, though. Well, I, I my argument was, was, what's the most reasonable explanation? And then there's it's an abductive argument, inference to the best explanation. I think what you're appealing to is more of like Paley's watch mind argument, which is an argument by analogy. So I, I don't think your criticisms are... If I gave the watch mind argument, I think you raised some good points. The problem is I'm not raising that kind of argument. Hi. Next question. Um, in the back row. Okay, so the question was, since I said, well, we can't prove uh, existence and we can't prove non-existence and there might be 50-50 chance, is there any reason we should switch if we are believers right now? But first of all, I didn't say that the chance is 50-50. I think the chance is more like 99.99999 for, for non-existence and very, 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 very small for existence. That's the first thing. And so why should we switch? Well, we should believe things that are true and not things that are not true. It's just uh, better for us. And uh, why, why, um, why should anybody switch and not believe and, and, and drop religion? Well, that's a whole other debate we have to have some other time <laughs> where the religion is useful and good for the world. I think it is not. So, and, but I don't think we have the time to go into this. Here in the front row. Hi, just real quick. Um, you mentioned that uh, the universe was, in, was very improbable. You cited some massive improbability number uh, older than the, more than the number of seconds in the universe. Um, now this is something that's already happened. Uh, much like the fact that I had breakfast this morning. The fact that I had breakfast this morning, if you want to put a probability figure on it, that's one. One to one. I did have breakfast this morning. Um, the probability of my having breakfast tomorrow is more unlikely. There's a chance that I couldn't have breakfast tomorrow. So. Yeah, Why? well, well Why? I think, yeah, one, one, I did not say, the, the number was not with respect to the universe coming into existence. Right, the, the, what I'm saying is that what was the probabilities, given the, the conditions that we know that are necessary for biological life, specifically human life, to survive, that's what, that's the number that I was based upon. So, but, uh, sorry, but, so, so if things, so you're saying that uh, it's incredibly improbable that this was that. So you're saying that if things were different, then it, they would be different, and that's a proof of God? Well, no, what I'm, what I'm arguing is this, is that the necessary conditions that we understand, this is not an argument from ignorance, this is an argument from what we know. All the necessary conditions, to give one example, the temperature range of the Earth, based upon the distance from the sun, the axial tilt, the rotation speed, all those variables that we know, we have a pretty good idea, what, a, a te a, what the temperature range would be in order for biological life and human life to survive. And what we're saying is, if it's just based upon probabilities, it's a highly, highly improbable event. So the question then is, I'm not, and once again, I'm not arguing, therefore God exists. What I'm saying is, what's the most reasonable explanation? In other words, and I use the example of the lottery. If somebody, if somebody had, if a highly improbable event, and, and here, if you're interested, William Dembski, I think, has done some great work on this, in terms of, it's not just the improbabilities, it's the specified complexity. Just like the analogy going back 